description. I want to first thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's uh, always a pleasure to visit Germany. I've been to Dresden before and I've always enjoyed my stay. And it's a particular honor to be among such august company on the topics that we're here uh, to discuss. Um, I'm an ecologist, a systems ecologist. I come at the whole idea of urbanization from a rather different perspective, therefore, than I suppose most of you in the room do. And if there's a major takeaway message I want you to receive from this, it is that you cannot observe cities or the process of urbanization in isolation from the much larger context in which this process is going forward. So that's the, the kind of starting point for my analysis. We really must consider urbanization as a phenomenon or a sub-phenomenon within a much larger human context uh, that includes the whole idea of unsustainability. How many of you feel that the current course of human development is sustainable? Raise your hands. All right, so I have to take from the absence of any hand that most of us agree that the current course of human development is unsustainable. And that's the framework within which we must consider urbanization. So that the kind of United Nations nice, smooth trends for the next 50 years have to be taken with something of a grain of salt because they depend upon a large number of other assumptions around energy supplies, climate change, and so on and so forth. Uh, those projections are based entirely on demographic data with no context whatsoever in terms of the biophysical framing in which those analyses go forward. So I'm going to start with a somewhat controversial assertion. You can take it or leave it, but here it is. In fact, unsustainability, the state that I think we all agree we are in, is an inevitable emergent property of the interaction of the human enterprise and natural systems. This is the case because the beliefs, values, and assumptions that, current govern, that currently govern uh, the development of humanity are completely at odds with the actual behavior of the natural systems within which we find ourselves. There are two major drivers here, many subcategories, but we have to understand that humankind has natural expansionist tendencies. That's what we've done forever. And these tendencies are currently being reinforced uh, by a cultural narrative based on unlimited technological development or unconstrained technological development and perpetual growth. So we have both culture or nature and nurture reinforcing each other along a particular uh, trajectory which is at odds with the behavior of the natural world in which we uh, find ourselves. Now I want to put this in an economic context. Sustainability, I think, was most succinctly defined. Everyone argues about how difficult it is to define. Nonsense, it's very simple. A sustainable society is one which does not undermine or destroy the natural, human, and built capital upon which it depends. John Hicks, or John Hicks in the 1930s, defined sustainable income as that level of consumption that a society can enjoy from one accounting period to the next without destroying its wealth producing capital. The corollary is obvious. No society is sustainable if its growth is being financed through the depletion or liquidation of its capital assets. So the question then becomes how well are we doing? Now we've seen variations on this theme, this curve throughout the conference, but I want to emphasize a few important points here. I could have extended the x-axis into the next building. So for 200,000 years of human history, there was no discernible population growth. Populations fluctuated uh, within the carrying capacity of their local environments up until just 200 years ago. Eight generations of human beings have experienced sufficient growth and technological change in their lifetimes even to notice it. So that this period, this last couple of hundred years of explosive growth, a fourfold increase in human population numbers in the 20th century alone, which we take to be the norm. Okay? Just read your papers. Two, three, four percent per year growth in the economy is the norm 
is actually the single most anomalous period in the history of humankind. We are currently in the most abnormal period in the history of our species. The second point to take from this is that the whole thing began, at least this explosive component of this growth, with the development of ways of using fossil fuel to acquire all of the other resources that we need to sustain the growth of human numbers. Fossil fuel is an external energy source, what we would call endo, uh, exosomatic energy source, which freed humans from the negative feedback normally keeping our populations in control. So what we're seeing here is the full expression of human biological potential growth, exponential growth, in an absence of negative feedback provided by fossil fuel. So the question becomes, in the absence of fossil fuel, how far and how long can we continue in this trajectory? And if we continue to use fossil fuels, there's the climate change issue to deal with. And there may not be sufficient fossil fuel in any case. So we're, we're up into a number of conundrums here in having created an accelerated explosion in the absence of due consideration of how it's going to be possible to continue that. And it's not just an explosion of human numbers. These are graphs taken from a recent paper uh, called The Great Acceleration, showing the super exponential growth of consumption of just about everything on the planet, accompanying the massive expansion of human numbers, but even more important, the rise in per capita income. Right now, the major driver of unsustainability is increasing material and energy throughput in the system as the result of rising incomes, which follow from urbanization. As we heard in our previous uh, uh, speech, uh, urbanization is attractive because people move to cities for the higher incomes, the higher levels of consumption that they may enjoy there. So this then becomes the context in which I, as a, a systems ecologist, attempt to examine the human condition. And what we find through our ecological footprint analysis is that humanity is in a state of overshoot. That's what climate change is all about. That's what landscape degradation is all about. That's what the pollution of the oceans is all about. We are in overshoot. This means that the demand, the demand by the human enterprise for the biophysical products of nature for life support services exceeds the capacity of natural ecosystems to supply those services. So demand outstrips supply. And in fact, we are now using bioresources of this planet at about 50% faster than they can be produced by natural systems. So the question becomes, how is that possible? It's because we're depleting the natural capital assets which accumulated over millions of years of history. We're using up the oil. We're drawing down the fish stocks. Fish stocks are collapsing. We're using soils at 10 to 40 times ra more rapidly than they can be regenerated by natural processes. So we don't even notice that this is going on because so long as there's a supply of money in the bank, we can keep drawing on it. And that's what we're doing, oblivious of the fact that we're eating up the natural capital and indeed much of our other physical capital required to maintain the situation. We can see on the far, whoops, that was unintended, uh, up here, a growing ecological deficit. This is the Hicksian deficit. We're expending our environment more rapidly uh, than it can reproduce itself. This is the very definition of unsustainability, growth through the depletion of natural capital. This is a much more significant deficit in the long run than are the fiscal deficits that our governments spend so much time being concerned about. And yet we pay absolutely no attention to it whatever simply because we're unused to thinking of ourselves in ecological terms. So the human eco footprint is currently about 18 or 19 billion hectares, but anybody can do this. There are only on this planet about 12 billion hectares of ecologically viable uh, ecosystems, croplands, forests, grasslands, fish, fishing grounds, and so on and so forth. And yet we're using them as if there were something like 19 billions. By the way, an eco footprint is simply the area of land and water ecosystems required to sustain the consumption by a specified population and to assimilate those, that population's uh, uh, wastes. So every one of you, if you're an average European, a, a German, for example, 
you require to sustain your lifestyle as an average individual about five global average hectares of ecologically productive land and water. That's your exclusive domain. And to the extent that uh, we're all in competition each other, I think we have to keep that in mind. But what has this got to do with urbanization? Most of us think of cities in these ways. As, this is our narrative. It's the built environment. High population densities, hotbeds of artistic, cultural, and uh, pop, uh, political activity. Jane Jacobs regarded cities as the engines of national economic growth. Well, those narratives are all true. On the other hand, we never think of cities as biophysical systems subject to natural law. And I, I could spend the whole of the day talking about the several laws that we should be paying attention here. I'm going to talk just about one. That's the law of thermodynamics. Someone mentioned it yesterday in a different context. But we have to think of cities as physical entities. And if we think of them as far from equilibrium dissipative structures, I don't want to confuse the issue by getting into that kind of jargon. A dissipative structure is simply a system that continues to produce itself and grow, but does so by assimilating vast quantities of energy and material from its environment and spewing huge quantities of wastes back into that environment. That's a dissipative structure. And it's an obligatory situation. No system can grow and maintain itself without the consumption of energy and material. There are no exceptions. So cities, if to put it in technical terms, maintain their internal order. This marvelous complexity around us is a product of a process of dissipation of resources that results in le uh, local low entropy, but at the expense of the increasing disordering or the increasing entropy of the larger system. Climate change is the dissipated products of fossil fuel going into the atmosphere. The carbon in a fuel is dissipated into the atmosphere. The entropy of the atmosphere increases as we increase the neg entropy or the organization of our system. But obviously, there's an imbalance here that can no longer be sustained. If we think of cities in this framing, they are what we would call as ecologists incomplete systems. Or they're heterotrophic systems. Cities become parasitic on the landscape. We saw a little bit of this in the previous presentation. So in a, and again, this is not all that cities are. But we have to begin to understand that cities, from a biophysical perspective, are intense nodes of consumption, energy and material consumption and waste generation, in a much larger fabric, which is the productive component. So if you want to think of the human ecosystem uh, system in an urban context, there are two components. The central node of consumption, now we talk of it of production. All right, we produce wealth in the city. But to produce that wealth requires the physical consumption of energy and material. The production of that energy and material uh, takes place elsewhere on the planet and is vastly larger than what we normally think of as a city. And yet both components must be included in the human ecosystem. Now, just to show you that I'm not the only person thinking this way, I invented the idea of eco-footprint analysis, but this is a completely independent study I had nothing to do with by Carl Folke and his group at Stockholm University. They looked at the 29 largest cities in the Baltic states region, and by the way, Dresden would be very similar to these cities. The little tiny square in the center here represents the average square kilometer of these 29 cities in terms of population and, and material consumption. Now, what they found is that for every square kilometer of those 29 cities, we require 133 square kilometers of marine area to produce the fish those people consume, 50 square kilometers of arable land, 18 square kilometers of forest. These are the productive ecosystems needed to provide the food and fiber for each square kilometer. They also found uh, hundreds of square kilometers of, of land over and waters here required to assimilate the wastes, the carbon waste, the nitrogen, phosphates, and so on, dissipated by the consumption in the city. So what we have to recognize is that what we see as the city is less than 1% of the total human ecosystem. In this case, it's a tenth of 1% in, in that range. Well, what are the implications of this for the longer term? See what I'm saying here? You cannot separate this little thing 
from all of this other. If this city, this one square kilometer of city, were separated, isolated from these other blocks, it would simply disappear. It would cease to exist. There would be no supply of resources and no sink for its wastes. That's what these other elements contain. And only when you look at them all together do you have a functional ecosystem capable of self-sustaining into the future. But even that wouldn't happen if we're growing by destroying either of these other components, which is precisely what we're doing. There are other implications. If we look at a city such as Tokyo, now we were warned against the formation of uh, megacities by the previous speaker. Uh, Tokyo is a city of some uh, 300, uh, 35 million people. It has an ecological footprint 350 times larger, somewhat smaller than the Baltic cities, than its uh, metropolitan region. But the point is, Japan could not sustain even its capital city if it were isolated uh, through uh, climate change or the failure of the global trade system or whatever. The current level of consumption by the population of Tokyo would require uh, at least the equivalent of two islands of Japan with all of the surrounding uh, territory. Now, that requires us to look at the world in a slightly different way as well. Some of you may have seen variations on this theme. But if everyone on this planet were to acquire the material standards that we enjoy in Europe or, or Canada, we're, we're quite similar. Uh, Canadians are a little less efficient, so we have a somewhat larger footprint. But the point is, just to sustain current levels of consumption of the entire world population, 7.3 billion people, at European or Canadian standards would require three or four planets in total. We don't have three or four planets in total. And the idea that we can decouple growth from the material world is nonsense. There are three billion people who do not have their material needs satisfied on this earth today. These are the people to whom material growth should by di be directed. But to raise those three billion people to anything like European standards obviously requires a massive increase in energy and material consumption. So the notion that the economy can continue to grow to satisfy the needs of the world's poor and at the same time dematerialize is a fantasy. In many respects, and I, I quote a, a sociologist who's begun to understand these things, today's city is the most vulnerable social structure ever conceived by humans. They are threatened by climate change, land degradation, energy and material resource shortages, which are beginning to loom, and uh, the resultant geopolitical instability as the conflict among nations for the remaining resources become exacerbated. Much of the current dis uh, disruption of civic society in the Middle East is in fact the result of unease around land and food shortages that are already beginning to plague some of our uh, most ancient uh, cultures on the, on, on the planet. Despite this context and these barriers, we expect, if the smooth projections of the UN are correct, to add something like two and a half billion people to urban systems over the next half century. So we've got, a, a, I think, a situation here that we have to contextualize in a much more sensitive way. Now, everything I've given you so far is just data that anyone can look up. At this point, I'm going to go into a slightly more speculative mode. We agree that the world is unsustainable. I'm going to assert that we're not doing anything as a society to make much of a difference. Most of the activity that goes forward in the name of, uh, say, sustainability does not address the fundamental disjunction between the nature of the human system and the biophysical systems that are supporting us. This means that I think, again, this is what I think, we will see an implosion or decrease in the scale of the human enterprise in coming decades, probably within this century, and it will come from one of two sources. In coming years, the human enterprise will likely contract. Now, as an intelligent, moral species capable of planning ahead, at least that's how we like to think of ourselves, we can choose between business as usual, which, by the way, is the choice in the mainstream at present. We're reinforcing most of the institutions that have created the problem we're all here to discuss. So if we do this, and we recognize that basically we're a subsystem of a larger system, and the subsystem is growing by consuming the larger system, that means a uh, 
chaotic explosion of nature or implosion of nature through climate change or some other major impact, followed by geopolitical turmoil. Now, is that a rational choice of an intelligent plan forward species? Or we can select to do a well-planned, orderly, cooperative descent. What we need is a smaller, global, steady-state economy that's more equitable than our present world situation and that can continue to operate indefinitely within the productive capacity of nature. Why would we think about this? Well, first of all, no city can be sustainable in isolation from the larger system. Dresden could be the absolute epitome of a sustainable city, but if the rest of the world continues on its current path, Dresden goes down with it. A second reason is that our individual and national interests have essentially converged with the interests of humankind. The cowboy mentality of competitive individuality, everyone for himself, is completely the wrong model for the kind of world in which we find ourselves. Sustainability is a collective problem demanding collective solutions. We can't go it alone. So this calls for an unprecedented level of global cooperation and recognition of this problem. The goals of a nexus process, therefore, are to achieve both a substantial reduction in the human ecological footprint, so that the human enterprise is operating within the productive means of nature. We need a, a smaller, materially efficient, more equitable steady state economy that can function indefinitely within the means of the natural systems that support us. We need to rethink the good life, including significant adjustments to the consumer lifestyle, and we need to talk seriously be about the long-term trajectory of human population. It can't continue to grow up. We cannot continue to think we can support 8 or 10 billion people if we're already in overshoot on a planet that is in decline because of the consumption of the current. You know, you can't put two liters of wine in a one liter bottle, people. This idea of one planet living is not a preference. It's just not, it's not something we can Oh, well, you might like that, but I like this. It's an absolute. You either do it or you don't. We only have the one planet. What do we have to do to continue to persist and live on it? So the per capita eco footprints of urban dwellers uh, already range between four and eight global hectares. Your fair share is only 1.7 hectares to get to one planet living. And this is technologically and socially possible. We need to reduce our footprints by 60 to 80%. In, Tor in Vancouver, rather, we're uh, working on the greenest city plan. These are the uh, goals that the city has considered to be politically acceptable within the kind of framework I'm talking about. Uh, everyone can have these slides, so I'm not going to read them out for you. Uh, if we achieved all of these acceptable goals, it would take us 20% in the correct direction. Vancouver needs to reduce by 65%. What it's willing to consider would only take us down by about 20%. Now, the problem there is that we live in a world in denial. Most of what I'm telling you today or talking about, based on real data that anyone can look up, is denied in the mainstream. And it's a human problem to ignore uncomfortable facts. This goes back to Gustave Le Bon, the first quote of French uh, it doesn't matter, psychologist in the 18th century, 19th century, the masses never thirst after truth. They turn aside from evidence, not to their taste, preferring to deify error. So if our wrong way of thinking makes us feel good, ah, that's what we'll prefer to do. The second quote is an American pop philosopher. For us, to, for us to maintain our way of living, we tell lies to each other. Well, this is the epitome of denial. It's getting worse because in the United States and Canada particularly, but I see it happening here as well, we've been engineered, engineered to ignore reality. We prefer the reassuring lie to the inconvenient truth. There's a vast propaganda machine out there promoting corporate values and interests at the expense of community interests. We live in a new age of unreason. More and more people in the developed world profess a belief in magical thinking as opposed to the reality in which we find ourselves. This is the endarkenment upon us, and it obfuscates any real progress toward the future. And it's a long-term endemic problem of human beings. Uh, this is a marvelous Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, Barbara Fuchman's book on the March of Folly. Here's a quote, wooden-headedness, the source of self-deception de 
plays a remarkably large role in government. It consists of assessing a situation in terms of fixed, preconceived notions, ideology, or some political platform, while ignoring the contrary signs. It is acting according to wish, while not allowing oneself to be deflected by the facts. Now, historically, this has resulted in collapse after collapse after collapse of governments and societies. Look at us today. Someone mentioned yesterday the Club of Rome report, um, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, limits to growth, universally rejected, this is my last slide, by economists and just about everybody else in the 1970s. Only recently, the last three or four years, have there been three studies of the real world in comparison to the base case scenario of the limits to growth study. The purple dots are real world data. And you'll notice they're tracking the limits to growth study absolutely, which leads to a collapse situation uh, sometime toward the middle of this century. And by the way, other cultures have gone through the same process. Collapse of a complex society is a repeating event, event in human history. Joseph Tainter, read this book, The Collapse of Complex Societies. What he says is, perhaps what is most intriguing in the evolution of human species is the regularity with which the pattern of increasing complexity, sophistication, and so on is interrupted by collapse because we are endemically predisposed to denial and therefore not to taking the actions necessary to save ourselves. In theory, the modern human tragedy is that we could solve this problem. We have the technology, we have the resources, we have the means, but as we continue to deny it, uh, we're condemning ourselves to a, a much less rosy future than could otherwise be the case. Sorry, but that's the truth of the matter as I see it. And if you want to argue with me, I can take some questions. Thank you. So thank you very much for this engaged presentation. And I'm sure there would be a lot of argumentation pro and con. We only have time for one question, I'm afraid, but uh, I would encourage to keep on discussion afterwards in the coffee break. You are closest, so <laughs> maybe, maybe you go up to a microphone or uh, which we have confronted. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for the description of that uh, disaster which we are confronted to. Uh, but is there any signal on the horizon, any light you can see for change? Hmm? Uh, first of all, look, I, I don't want to be promoting a disaster here. What I'm trying to do is turn on the lights and wake us up. As I say, this is completely avoidable. But it requires thinking about the issues in a different way from the way we normally think about these issues. Is there some light on the horizon? Yes, there are thousands around the world now of NGOs who are working their hearts out, trying to get the mainstream to pay attention to the reality in which most people find themselves. This is a, a, a kind of viral, I think, a disease that will spread into wider society once more and more people in the affluent countries begin to feel the pinch. You see, in North America, I, I'm sure it's happening here as well, we actually see increasing poverty. The country, the United States, for example, has never been richer, but it's never had a higher proportion or a larger number of people in poverty who are beginning to realize that this system is working against them. Occupy Wall Street was the first real sign of social discontent on a sufficiently broad scale level uh, to you know, raise to consciousness that there's something going on here. Now, my personal feeling is that we need to get to the point where there is almost civil insurrection before the political mainstream begins to pay adequate attention to this. At least in the North American context, the corporate sector has purchased the political process. It doesn't matter which of the main parties are elected. They have the same basic platform, which is the protection of the corporate values which are bringing us these problems. And at some point, the, the erosion of the middle class and the rise of, of, of civil discontent will capture the attention of politicians. I personally hope it will happen before it's too late that any action will be useless. And that's the biggest problem. 
If you take a system's view of this, there are lags and delays in the response of the system. The global warming we have seen to date, that is a 0.8 Celsius degree increase in mean global temperature, isn't the result of today's levels of carbon dioxide, but the levels reached perhaps 30 or 40 years ago. Even if we stabilize today, we have decades of warming ahead of us as the system catches up to the current level of CO2 emissions. We can't afford to wait for these lags or we're very much in trouble. So we need to act now. Every one of us has a responsibility to our communities and to ourselves uh, to be as vocal as possible in raising these concerns with our political leaders. That's a message of hope, by the way, in case you Th want. Thank you, Dr. Ries. Thank you for the awakening. Uh, thank you for the awakening presentation. If I may challenge your uh, uh, thought that we as a human race are expensive and argue that it's only happened when we lost in touch with, with the land. It's only, it happened only when our children think that grapes grow in March and, and Walmart and get in touch with the soil and with the land and with the sustainability. So that that deviation point has a root in, 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 in that soil, in, in being in touch with the ecology, with the system, and sweat to produce. Would you comment on this, please? There are two competing theories about, for example, a demographic, a demographic transition. It's much too complicated to get into in this context. But in some sense, it's irrelevant, because this, we're already in a state of overshoot. Right? That's what we agreed on in the first instance. We're in an unsustainable situation because we're using the planet faster than it can reproduce. That's a simple fact. Now, we are destined to grow for the foreseeable future. Nobody disagrees with that because of the uh, inherent uh, fertility of vast numbers of young women in much of the developing world. That's what these UN projections are all about. Now, there are reasons why we could bring that around, but we're not going to do so in the time frame that we need to do so. So we have to deal with the growth situation in the short term, meaning the next few decades. Moreover, and this is the, perhaps a more important point, today the main driver of unsustainability is the increase in per capita consumption, more even than the growth in the human population numbers. So. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation and for the discussion.